guys, welcome to the Bluestone Villa, our DIY Victorian house renovation. Today, I'm gonna to be taking you step by step through our DIY patio build from start to finish. It's going to be the first of a few videos that will sit within kind of garden renovations on a budget. So I'll be taking you from designing that patio on the back of an envelope, yes, very professional, all the way up to laying the last slab. I'll be talking through our exact process, all of the tools that we used, and stick around to the end because I'll also be sharing exactly how much this project cost us and also approximately how much we saved by doing this ourselves. In total, I think probably cumulatively, the work may have taken a week or so, but we split that up for a number of reasons that I won't bore you with um, across lockdown and slightly beyond, and we've just finished it. I really wanted to share this experience with you because building your own patio sounds a little mad and kind of a bit stressful and complex and James didn't really find it that difficult. Bear in mind, you know, we both have just regular office jobs. We're not at all kind of building professionals. So I wanted to share this experience to give you the confidence to maybe be able to do something similar yourself. It was actually a really simple process once we got our heads around what we're doing. And so I'm gonna share that process with you. I've split it into two phases. So design, prep, our favorite, and build. Without further ado, let's get started. Seeing as we're talking patios, I have made myself a nice little Aperol spritz, which is probably one of my favorite drinks to drink out on a patio. So design. We broke down design in several ways. So location of the patio, shape and size, and also understanding the materials we might use to form that patio. So location was a bit of a no brainer for us. We actually already have an existing patio at this property. It's the traditional patio. It sits off the back of the house, but it's really not in a great state. I think that's a future project way <laughs> on the line at some point but it's quite shallow and we actually already had patio furniture that we brought with us from the flat and it just wouldn't have looked right in the space it would have been too big and bulky so we knew that we weren't going to put that there and we knew therefore that we needed to create a separate social space somewhere else additionally our patio off the back of our house also loses a sun in kind of mid-afternoon and the location that we've selected keeps the sun for the longest point of the day. And finally, the space that we've put this was just kind of redundant. It was kind of a bit of a waste of space. And now that we've put this patio in there, it just looks like it should have been there from the get go. So I definitely recommend thinking about where else you might like to put a patio. I don't think it has to be in the traditional sense of just being straight off the back of your property. Next, you're going to want to move on to size and shape. So we didn't want to create a massive patio, but we did obviously want it to be big enough that it housed our patio furniture. So that was really our kind of driver for how big. Additionally, obviously, we were putting it in the corner of the garden. The easy option would be just to plonk a square in that corner. But that honestly wasn't what we wanted to do. We wanted this patio to look like it belonged there to look like it had always been there and definitely for it to kind of soften into its environment so we did go with a kind of square shape but actually it's like shaved off the one of the corners so you've got kind of an angle and then we've got kind of got a step up into it. We actually drew, or should I say James, drew the patio on the back of an envelope a few times over to kind of get a sense of exactly what we wanted, which helped us develop that idea around the angle. Initially, we had also thought we wanted a pergola, but being able to draw it out and kind of configure that in our heads a little bit made us realize that actually we thought that could be quite bulky and a bit closed in for such a small space. We also decided as part of that, that we wanted to keep a ball border of soil around the edges that met the fence so that we could add additional plants to that area and lighting to kind of really make the space just the absolutely most beautiful it could be. And then we went outside and we actually planned that space out with just kind of twigs and cotton. So we mapped it out. It gave us the opportunity to look at it and think, no, it needs to be slightly bigger or slightly smaller and really kind of play around with the space. Obviously, we had the added benefit of already owning our patio furniture. So we were able to put that in the space and double check that that will work together 
If you don't already own furniture that you're planning to put on your new patio, then I'd recommend maybe looking at some styles that you like, getting some example dimensions and working from there. And finally, we looked up a bunch of different inspiration photos on Pinterest and Instagram. And I even kind of scrolled through some of the people that I follow on my account to see what they've done for their patios. And that was how we came to the decision that we wanted to border our patio with sleepers. We just felt that that was the easiest and most aesthetically pleasing option for us to do. Next, we're gonna move on to prep. And if you've worked on DIY projects before or renovations or decorating, you're gonna know that prep is the saddest element of any project like that. And I'm afraid to tell you that unfortunately it is, is, this, it is the case with um, a DIY patio build as well. It was the most laborious. It was just, yeah, a little bit sad. Fortunately, I didn't have to do anything in that part. Um, for that, you're going to require a shovel, a wheelbarrow. I think that was it. Yeah, so James basically dug out the area. So we kept intact this pieces of string at, or sp string or cotton and sticks. And James dug that area out. He dug it, I believe, to about 100 millimetres deep. So yeah, so it's digging all of that out. It's really hard work. And I would say actually the most annoying and most hard work part of the whole process. Partway through um, digging out the space, we actually also had our sleepers delivered. So obviously we just measured out the space to kind of anticipate how many we'd need. We actually ordered about eight sleepers. Some of them will be able to sit completely in place intact and others we were going to need to kind of modify slightly to fit in the different spaces that we were creating. But it was really handy to have them there because we were able to slot them in whilst we were digging out just to kind of get a sense of the space, to get a sense of the depth. And then we move on to build, which is definitely the most exciting part of the project because that's when you will see it all coming together. So there are a number of different tools and supplies you're gonna need for this. I'm gonna rattle through those as and when we come across them through the process. So first of all, you are going to want to make a good sub base, I believe it's called, which is basically like your foundations of your patio. So you're going to get some type one in order to do that. So I've been told by James that you can buy type one in bags just from your local Wix, etc. But actually, it's really expensive to do that. So the recommendation is actually to go to a builder's merchants and get that ordered through them. It's much more cost effective. So we actually went through four tons of type one. And if you order it through a builder's merchants, they'll come and deliver it to you and drop it at your drive. So there is a little bit of manual work of kind of carrying it from your drive space through to your back garden, but well worth it based on cost difference. James also said that we could have actually used just three ton probably of type one if we had packed out the patio a little bit more with some of our extra soil. Um, but we didn't do that. There we go. So we used the four tons, but it's absolutely fine. We've got a really solid base. I think James was basically saying that we've got such a good solid foundation, kind of unnecessary to be as good as ours is, if that makes sense. There's also loads of great calculators online that helps you calculate exactly how much type one you're going to require for the space that you've created. And you're also going to want to hire a whacker plate, which I have no idea how to spell. And I was like the top speller in my primary school. The whacker plate basically packs down your material so we actually used it in two separate ways so before we put the type one in the space James actually used it just to go over the soil that, that was there left in our dugout space just to kind of get it compacted down as much as possible and kind of as flat as possible once we compacted the soil down we then put in the sleepers so as I said some of them could stay intact and others we needed to make sure that they fit the space in the right way so for that you're going to need a tape measure and if you're doing any kind of angled um, cuts in your sleepers and you're also going to need a set square. So James just basically measured them out and then he cut them with a circular saw. So apparently the circular saw um, only goes so deep so it only goes about five centimeters deep and our sleepers were 10 centimeters. So what James would do is he'd mark out where he wanted to make the incision He'd cut through as far as it would go, so essentially five centimetres, and then he'd flip 
the sleeper over and do the same on the other side to make the full cut. And then of course, with the ones that required kind of certain angular cuts, he used a set square in order to work out exactly how he'd mark those up. And again, went through the same process. He also at points used a regular handsaw as well. So those were the two saws that he used to do most of that work. And then once he was happy with all of the sleepers and they were all kind of in situ, he then screwed them all together with, he just said kind of wood screws and a drill. And then we started bringing the type one in. So again, you're gonna use your wheelbarrow, your shovel, um, and I used a rake as well. So this is where my help came in. So James would bring the type one out back, deposit it into our patio space and I would rake it out to kind of make it even. I'm not gonna lie, again, it was kind of quite laborious in terms of it was a lot of hard work. Literally the next day I felt like I had been to the gym and done a solid, solid workout. Um, we also did it on a particularly hot day. I don't know if anybody recalls VE Day in the UK, but it was like really epic weather and all of our neighbours were having this lovely street party. You know, haven't seen anybody in ages, we're in the middle of lockdown and James has me raking type one across our new patio. Once we had all of the type one on that space, James then used the whacker plate again, which was really why we hired it in the first place. And he took that across the whole space. And again, it really just compacts it down and meshes it all together. A lot of it will actually really kind of crush up and become kind of fine stone, crumbs I don't know some of it will still stay intact as kind of larger chunks but you'll you'll get the sense it kind of turns to sand in a way and that was kind of that element of the build done so then comes the exciting part picking out your slabs and laying them so this is why we actually had a bit of a stall in finishing our patio because as I said we were in lockdown and we just didn't want to buy that online we wanted to go somewhere and actually pick out our slabs ourselves we thought we'd go down the Indian sandstone route. When we went to go and look, we saw some great other options as well, but actually the Indian sandstone in the gray was the most cost effective. It didn't require you to buy it in packs. So you could kind of buy as much or as little as you needed. And if you say didn't calculate it quite right, you could also add on to that afterwards. Whereas everything else had to be bought in certain amounts of packs and James was just a little bit concerned that if we kind of miscalculated you know what was that going to mean in terms of having to buy another pack etc and actually from a cost perspective it just worked out way cheaper to use Indian sandstone as well so we went down that route so we picked that out and then after a couple of weeks those those were delivered to us we were recommended to go with just kind of a one size because our patio space isn't particularly large the slabs came in lots of different sizes and shapes shapes, kind of little squares, kind of longer rectangles and kind of bigger slabs so that you can create kind of a bit of a pattern with that. But actually we were recommended that because it was a smaller space that would look too busy and we should just go with the one size, which I was really happy to do. So we went with the largest size slab. I think they were about 60 by 90 centimeters. So then comes creating the mortar. So you're gonna need a number of different tools for this. You're gonna need a hose pipe or at least some access to a, to a decent amount of water. We bought some plastic sheets to mix the mortar on the grass and so that we didn't spoil the grass. We bought a bunch of different kind of buckets to be able to transport the mortar around. And then you're going to need to buy cement and sand so that you can mix that together with the water to create the mortar. To give you a bit of a sense, we used five bags of building sand to one bag of cement to create enough mortar to essentially do two to three slabs at a time. Again, James would actually really recommend that you try and bulk buy the sand from a builder's merchants. We actually bought them as individual bags just from like B&Q and home base and stuff. And he said, actually, that was way more expensive. And you're going to mix that by hand. Um, you're going to kind of get it wet with the hose pipe, um, mix it up with your shovel. And you basically want to get it to the right consistency. And that consist consistency essentially is kind of, if you were to pick it up and kind of squeeze it, you should be able to mold it into a shape and it stay there. So you don't want it too sloppy and you also don't want it too dry. Before you lay the mortar down onto the patio space, you're going to want to wet the back of the slab because you want it to kind of create a suction. 
so that it sticks to the mortar and it stays there and dries in place. Now we worked out exactly where we wanted our slabs to go by first of all figuring out the pattern. So we just did it in kind of a brick pattern. We wanted it to be that when we looked at the kind of cutoff angle that we were looking at the slabs moving back that way. And for that, you're going to want to again get a stick with a bit of string to stick at the very back of your patio and one at the front of your patio so that you can check that you're moving in a kind of straight line. Also, you want a slight slope, really minimal, but just enough so that when it rains, the water kind of rushes forward um, and doesn't pool on the patio. And you're going to want a spirit level as well so that when you're placing the slabs down, you can check that they're all even, that they're even with the one behind and next to, etc. We also used the frame of the patio as a guide for where we place those slabs as well. Before James got going with the mortar, he actually laid a few of them out just to get a bit of an idea. Now, some of them he could fix down in their their current state as the full kind of big square, but others obviously were going to going to require shaving off some of the corners or shaving off sometimes large sections of the slabs. So for this, you're going to need an angle grinder and a pencil, again, to mark up exactly where you're going to cut them. James said he did this really by eye a lot of the time and things like he would lay the patio slab where it's meant to go and it would obviously kind of sit over the sleeper. And with that, he would just kind of mark up therefore where he needed to cut it and then just use the angle grinder freehand to cut that. He also recommends wetting the slab again before um, you do take that incision just to reduce the amount of dust when you're cutting it. He also used a framing square as part of that process as well. When we laid the slabs, we also obviously created um, gaps between the slabs and also around the frame. Um, and James said he just did that with his finger. There was no real science to it. It was probably about 10 millimeters space between them and obviously that's where you're going to eventually put the ground. Once you've got all of your slabs down you're obviously going to leave it to dry so we left ours for about 24 hours and then we could move on to grouting which sounds like it could be quite stressful, quite complex, maybe quite a lot of work and mm, what if it goes wrong but no we used um a material that was really innovative really quick really simple and honestly I was actually really amazed I was thinking wow I could just do this we used something called joint it simple which is what we were recommended by the place that we bought the slabs from so it's actually already pre-mixed you don't have to worry about kind of creating the grout in any way it comes in a vacuum packed Bag. So before you put it on, you're going to want to hose down your patio again just to get it really wet. This is a running theme. And then you're literally just going to tip it all over the patio. It doesn't matter if it goes on the slabs, literally everywhere. And then you're going to take a hard bristled broom and you're going to sweep that across it so that essentially all of the jointed simple goes into the joins and fills them. And you'll probably have some residue still left on some of the patio as well. And while you're doing that, you're also going to want to keep it wet while you're working. So you might add some additional water in here and there as well at that point. Then what you're going to do is you're going to take a soft bristled uh, broom and you're then going to sweep off any excess that is on the actual slabs themselves and you can literally put that back into the tub that it came in and put some water in there as well and you can use that again if you need it for any reason and that's it it's done that's the grouting process it literally took like minutes and maybe I'm missing I hope I'm not misrepresenting that there for James but it really didn't take very long at all like 10 minutes or so I it was nothing um and then it's a case of waiting for it to dry again so again we waited another 24 hours and then we sealed the slabs so sealing a patio is really important because you don't want anything to kind of any oils or anything to soak into the stone when you're using it. So red wine, like oil from food, anything like that. Now we actually did the sealant at the end, which I think sounds like the most like obvious thing. But what I would say to you is that having done this, we then maybe in like retrospect wondered whether we should have sealed them at the beginning. Maybe, you know, a qualified professional patio layer would not do it until the end but as we're kind of amateurs <laughs> over here 
Um, we obviously did get some water on some of the, the slabs. We tried to kind of clean it off immediately and stuff, but there were definitely probably a few little stains here and there. And so it did make us wonder whether we should have actually sealed them at the beginning. So that's something to consider and maybe to ask um, whoever you're buying your patio slabs from. But yeah, we had a sealant that we placed onto them. Um, James did it a combination of two ways. I think he used a br paintbrush kind of to do each one. And then I think on his last round, he has like a kind of like a car washing thing that he could use. And so he did that. So it was more like a hose effect. And we did three layers of that sealant because apparently that brings out the color the best. Again, what I would say to that is it did darken our slabs a little more than I had anticipated. And so initially I was like a little bit uncertain whether I loved them as much as when we first purchased them. They've definitely improved. Now it's like fully dried and everything think but just again something to bear in mind perhaps if we'd only done two layers it wouldn't have been as dark as it went um it was just a slight color difference and honestly you need the sealant so it's a no-brainer to do it but it just took me by surprise was all and once you've sealed it it's all done that's it, patio over, you've created your space. So now I'm gonna run through costs and I am actually gonna use a notebook for this because I'm a bit worried that I'm going to forget something. Our angle grinder, Jane said you could get as for as little as 40 pounds, but we actually bought one that came in a pack and it came with a smaller one as well because we would needed it for other jobs. So actually we spent as much as 130 pounds, but you could get it a lot cheaper, obviously, if this is like the only job you're planning to do with it. We obviously had things like shovel, rakes, some of this stuff we had already, but some we had to purchase new. Or we used a trowel also for the mortar. I should have said that earlier, apologies, to obviously um, smooth that out. We bought some extra buckets and tubs for moving the mortar around, the plastic sheets, um, a saw, a spirit level, a circular saw. Um, and for that, we kind of were predicting we probably spent around £60 for that particular element. Our sleepers were about, we think about £15, um, including VAT per sleeper, and we bought eight of those. Um, also, just to let you know, we used treated softwood sleepers but you can get oak sleepers etc but obviously they're more expensive our type one was about 40 pounds a bag and obviously we had four tons of it so we're calling that about 160 pounds our slabs were no more than 300 pounds um for the amount that we required. The joint tip, which was the grout was about 40 pounds and the sealant was about 20 pounds the Wacker plate, you can hire for a weekend and that will set you back about £40. That's also pretty inexpensive. I always thought that that would sound like that would cost like a ton of money to hire something like that, but absolutely not at all. Um, the sand and cement, as I said earlier, definitely buy the sand from Builders Merch and that's where we kind of messed up a little bit. Just We just wanted to get the job done. So we just went up to kind of a B and Q and what have you and bought bags. Um, so you can definitely get it cheaper than what I'm saying here. But for the cement, it was about £4.50 a bag of cement, and we had eight of those. Um, and the sand, it was all about £1.90 a bag, which doesn't sound like a lot, but we had 40 bags. So actually, it would have been a lot easier if we just had a big bag of sand delivered to us from a builder's merchants. Um, and it would have been the sand equated to about £76 by us doing it the way that we did. And James thinks we probably would have saved about £20 had we done it the other way. So in total... Our patio came, and I'm including the more expensive angle grinder here when actually you could definitely get that cheaper. Our patio came to about £942. So we spent under £1,000 to build our patio. Now, where we really saved the money, obviously, was around a tradesperson. So if you think that perhaps a patio of our size would take at least a week to build, and you're probably going to pay anything from between 150 to 250 pounds for a tradesperson. So I'm going to take the middle point for that. So we essentially saved ourselves another thousand pounds by doing this project ourselves. So thanks for joining me for another DIY project over here at the Bluestone Villa. We hope you'll stick around for more videos. I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.